Hello and welcome back to Having Fun Repairs. I've got a somewhat of a unique household repair. Uh, what you have, what I have in front of me is a uh, carpet uh, cleaner. This is a Hoover Dual Power Max uh, carpet cleaner. I've had it for several years. Uh, the model number is uh, FH51000. I've been using this for several years. Uh, specifically with the uh, attachment for some carpets uh, for some carpet applications with when it comes to cleaning primarily the vehicle and I realized that um, with the little spray nozzle with it attached to the front that water wasn't coming out so I had disassembled the hose attachment and the spray nozzle and pulled out the old tubing as tubing similar to this right here and saw that it had a lot of calcium buildup and I uh, replaced the tubing in it. However, that didn't resolve the problem. Now, before I get into the actual repair, what I believe is the problem, I will say that replacing the the uh, the uh, silicone tubing inside your flex nozzle, which attaches relatively simple, uh, re a relatively simple repair. The only thing that you really need to be concerned about, other than the length of replacement tubing that you buy is also ensuring that you measure the diameter of the tube that you are going to replace a little cheap calibration tool like this should work you'd measure the outside the diameter uh, and then you also need to measure the inside diameter of this tube to find a uh, comparative, a nice uh, comparative replacement. And you can pretty much find the silicone tubing anywhere, even uh, I want to say I bought this off of Amazon. <clears throat> nice spool of it. Uh, and then I used that to run into the hose. Now I'm not going to show the repair of that. I did that thinking that this was going to be a, a simple fix, thinking that the issue was just calcium built up inside the flex tubing it, itself. But that happened to not be the case. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, essentially I'm going to remove uh, four screws on the front there um, I got screws on the back and I can unlock this and just completely remove that that's no big deal so let's see I'm going to remove these screws in here inside this plate you've got two in the back uh, two in the front and then the four screws here plus the two up here uh, four screws here plus two one on either side of here and then open this up to show you what I believe is the fault my daughter is not a big fan of this thing, so she got a little upset once she saw it out. But she's doing much better now. I got her entertained with some uh, Disney Plus going on, on TV. Uh, I wanted to point out real quick. Uh, I pointed out these four screws here. You know, two up there and then four here. Uh, I wasn't paying attention. There are two more screws here. Then once this is removed, you'll find... Uh, two more screws here and we'll need to gain access to uh, what's underneath uh, here that needs to be replaced now when it comes to disassembly I would say and recommend uh, please take your time when with disassembly uh, no hard pulling or anything if something doesn't feel like it's going to budge uh, just make sure that you have loosened up or removed all the screws before proceeding all right, now that I got those screws loose, I've got this pried up a little bit. I'm trying not to put too much pressure on it because I don't want it to crack. And I don't want to fully disassemble because that 
that's uh, a lot of work. Uh, I don't recommend doing it this way, but as long as you're careful, you should be good. You see, I took my screwdriver and then I popped it into uh, this peg here to keep it slanted it upwards. Now, this is the device that we're going to have to remove. Now, I want you to know that I have been in here once before and had it removed it. And what this is, is a solenoid style um, um, pump, uh, kind of like a water pump. Um, but uh, if you notice there, uh, I put a white zip tie up here. You'll see a white zip tie down here. Originally what was on it was a metal style clamp. Uh, and that's to securely fasten the uh, bottom portion of this and make sure that it doesn't slide off. So even though I zip tied it now, uh, just after I disassembled it to clean it up and test it to see if it will continue to work, I uh, only zip tied it back. When when we do the permanent replacement of this, uh, I will use the zip tie again, but I also will use some epoxy to help keep this secure. That epoxy will have to dry for 24 hours before we can proceed for use. So give me a little bit. Uh, it's just a couple screws that need to come off of here, as well as looks like we have a uh, ground wire to remove. <laughs> And then our AC mains uh, going into the solenoid uh, pump. A white lead and then a black lead. And then we should be able to take this out. I'll have to cut the zip ties. And we should be able to completely remove this from out of here. Okay, so here it is uh, removed. I ignored this one. This is a replacement one I'm going to use. Uh, we're going to disassemble it. Now, uh, there are some items I'm going to transfer over to the replacement uh, solenoid valve, uh, solenoid water pump, whatever you want to call it. But if you notice, uh, right on the top here, you have a uh, diode symbol. Uh, it also tells you your voltage rating 110 is 120. Um, this has the replacement has the same voltage rating uh, from your mains 120 60 Hertz uh, diode is at the same post uh, aligned the same direction uh, there is a slight difference between the two now this is the the bad one uh, see it's rated for 22 watts this one's rated for 23 watts uh, ideally, you would want to replace a like-for-like -like item. However, this was very hard to come by, so I had to find something that was relatively close. Now, they make um, solenoid valves, uh, water pumps with a lower wattage rating and ones with higher wattage. Um, however, if you were to uh, get one rated for a higher wattage, um, that could draw on your power supply, your AC mains, probably increase your electric electricity bill a little bit. Uh, it could also burn out the switch, especially if you were to get one with a uh, lower wattage rating on a constant use. I would imagine that the solenoid would fill a lot quicker or burn out uh, more quick. But uh, let's disassemble this really quick. Because I'd like to take an opportunity to semi explain how uh, one of these items work. Now like I said, I had replaced this already. Um, well, not replaced it, but taking this out already uh, and taking it apart just to see if it was uh, if there was a a lot of not corrosion but uh, calcium build up inside the the plunger and the spring here keeping this thing from uh, opening and shutting and cleaned it up a little bit and it worked for a second and then stopped working again and now that I've got a replacement in we could kind of take some comparative measurements uh, this will go over onto this side but basically what you have is your coil 
Now, when your AC is presented at this coil, it's going to create an electromagnetic field. And that electromagnetic field, let's take this apart very carefully. Hopefully not releasing too much water. And there's a little bit of water still left in there. And there's the plunger, copper plating, and then your spring at this end. You can see there's not a whole lot of corrosion or anything in here. So I imagine that the failure was not with this. Okay. Um, want to relatively quickly, let's take some measurements. I'm going to put this on diode test. And I want to say your top is going to be the ground, the center is going to be your positive. It is, and I've got continuity in that direction. And I do not have continuity in the other direction. Now when I have continuity on the diode test, I am getting a reading of 1.5. 635 uh, volts DC. I wonder what the difference will be comparatively to this one. I can actually hear the beep, which actually represents a good diode, so maybe there's an issue with the diode. And I'm getting a measurement of 0.67 volts DC, which is probably close to like a Schottsky's diode or something like that. I want to also take a resistive measurement. Um, put that sideways and we'll compare to two and this is where I believe we're going to find that the failure exists we have 10 mega ohms of resistance across this coil and 2.3 mega ohms of resistance across this one so you have a lot of resistance across this coil which is probably the reason for the failure more than likely uh, suspect somebody will know a great deal more substantial information than I do and can correct me but the basis for how this works is you have your uh, coil uh, this device here okay which I will draw it as such uh, we'll say that this is where one of the uh, wires coming from your AC mains comes in and this one's the other one and then here goes your coil and you have a diode in line here and then inside this plastic tubing as we saw is a spring-loaded uh, plunger. Oh, there goes the stopper on that end. I got that little piece. Just going to uh, get down in there. There we go. Put this back together. All right. So let's say that this resides inside the coil as such. You have the spring, you have your plunger, the copper piece that's going to hit that spring, copper piece is going to hit this spring on this end, and that little rubber ball uh, at the tip. So in here is your plunger, okay? Uh, let's pretend that this is the metal tubing. Here goes the spring on this end, here goes the smaller spring, a little rubber ball on this end. Water is going to come in this direction and it's going to come out over here. Now, as AC comes in, AC you know is a uh, sinusoidal waveform, okay? Peak to peak voltage about uh, peak to peak being about 120 volts AC. And then if you were to measure from your an entire cycle the time it takes to complete one cycle 
and take the inverse of that, you get the frequency of about 60 hertz. Now, we know that a coil can be used to generate an electromagnetic field. What that does is it causes this tubing, uh, excuse me, this plunger to be attracted to the coil and it should move backwards across the spring. And what this does is it frees up this spring and this, plunge, this uh, ball here to allow water to come through. Now, the purpose of this diode is that way this is only energized during the positive uh, cycle of your AC waveform. So your AC is always in reference to a zero volt re uh, reference. So there are some applications where an AC could be riding a higher reference, say 5 volts DC. You could still have, say, 120 volts AC riding that 5 volts DC but your peak uh, upper and lower peaks would shift, say, uh, 65 here and 55 here, but you'd still be looking at uh, 60 peak, 60 between your reference point to peak and 120 overall. Anyways, I digress. During the positive cycle of your AC as it comes in, this should be energized and then during the negative cycle of your AC mains it should de-energize um, allowing what I presume this coil is nominally closed allowing this to uh, close once again I mean the spring is going to push the plunger back down I guess this spring and this rubber ball is going to stop the output flow of water from this end right here so this happens repeatedly, right? Because AC is applied, it's going to continually come in as an AC waveform until you remove the mains voltage to it. So as water is coming in over half cycle, this plunger shifts down, allowing water through, and then the um, magnetic uh, uh, the magnetic field that's generated is de-energized. The spring releases uh, or push allows the pressure to push back that way because this is no longer uh, attracted to the coil. And the plunger is closed and stops water. And by that method, it allows a pumping style action in order for water to come in and be forced out the other side. So, as I mentioned, I uh, could not find a light for light replacement. So there is a couple differences between this one and that and the one I'm going to replace with. Uh, obviously this has a slightly higher water rating but it's not too high. These tabs are bent down so I will attempt to straighten them out to make them similar to this. I am going to move over these rubber grommets that are used for holding this in place inside the actual uh, assembly and the equipment and I should and the other thing is we had a ground wire attached to the chassis of this coil uh, that is missing from here so more than likely what I'll do is take a Dremel and put it in a small hole to reattach that ground and maybe just solder it in place okay quite a bit more of a mess than I was hoping for, especially with all the metal shavings. If you want to know uh, how I determined the type of drill bit to use, I matched up the one to the previous hole uh, to see what the right diameter would be. And then here on the screw itself, it needs to go in, I compared the width of the screw with the width of the drill bit I was to use and uh, just basically eyeballed um, to see if it was going to be around the same size with exception of where you see uh, these teeth or whatever you want to call them they should be a tad bit longer than the width of this so you have something that's going to actually bite in now with that screw drilled 
uh, or with the hole drilled. And I'd be very careful not to put it all the way through and start going through the housing on this. I am hoping that this will somewhat self tap uh, with the old screw by screwing it in. Now, now we'll probably have to do this off camera because it's a little bit too finicky for me to do while on camera, but the idea is that I'll get the screw in place and slowly turn it in in to allow it to try to self tap um, then I'll back it out a bit clean it out and start screwing it in further back it out a bit clean it out screw it in further back it out a bit clean it out screw it in further now these uh, solenoid valves these are uh, types of uh, electromagnetic water pumps if I can call them that uh, they're actually fairly common in steamers. Uh, you will find them in uh, uh, espresso machines and coffee machines as well. So I would always uh, say if you have some broken items around your house before you go online trying to uh, purchase a light for light replacement, uh, if you got like a coffee machine or espresso machine or say a, a garment steamer or something around the, that line that no longer works but you haven't thrown away uh, tear it apart see if you got something similar in it and you could more than likely uh, have something that you could do a one-for-one -one, uh, swap into out of uh, to get what you what you're trying to repair working again so hold on a second I am going to try and tap uh, instead of using a tap and die trying to Rethread. That's what I was looking for. The threads, not the teeth. Uh, Rethread this with the old screw. Hopefully, it doesn't tear the threads up too much. Uh, and then uh, we'll work on installing. And I'll be right back. Okay. So the idea is to have this mounted just like it was previously in here. Um, obviously, that helps hold it in place. And as you know, I move the rubber grommets fitting that help with the fitting in there. Now I will feed the uh, the tubes back in um, and then using zip ties helps secure them around the end of uh, this PVC or plastic tubing. However, uh, in order to, to uh, better secure the one at the end, I'll use some of this uh, Loctite uh, Geo to glue or go to glue. Uh, it takes about 30 minutes to set. I'll put a bead around it and then the tube over, being very careful not to get any into the actual hole, uh, and then zip tie it in place. It takes about 30 minutes to uh, to set and then 24 hours to fully cure. So after 24 hours, uh, there shouldn't be any. Uh, what I'm trying to prevent is the actual rubber tubing in here. In case there's any pressure uh, it coming off and that glue should help secure it along with the uh, zip tie replacement now is that the right way to go about it well no it had a metal clamp on it hold it in place uh, preferably you would do something like that I do not have one so I'm relying on the uh, the strength of the zip tie to keep pressure around the tube and here and then the glue to help secure it in place uh, and hopefully that will work uh, over time with lump and be uh, give us some re relatively some good longevity out of uh, uh, with the use of this replacement uh, solenoid valve. Okay, so I've got the button in place. Uh, say one thing I had to change is unfortunately the uh, the screw. The threads were just uh, tearing up on the screw when I tried to use this to uh, re-thread the chassis. So what I had uh, that screw into the chassis. So what I had to do is I took this uh, grounding wire and I soldered it onto the chassis. I'm not too happy about that. I had to keep the heat on the chassis for quite a bit of time just to get solder to adhere to it, and then solder the wire onto it. Um, you know, hindsight 2020, uh, 
think now I have a reason to actually get a tap and die set so I can do things better. But that wire is secured. I've got this uh, fully installed. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned, zip ties over both ends. And then I put that uh, epoxy on the outside of this before sliding the tube over. You can see that it's started to, uh, uh, what is it, set. So it's doing pretty good. Uh, let's see. Yeah, if I turn the light on, you can see some flux residue. I should have cleaned it off, but uh, this right here is soldered into the chassis down there. But anyways, uh, so this is in. Um, I think as of now, what we'll do, what I'll do is I'll button the rest of this up. Uh, I'll let it. I'll let it cure for probably about an hour, and it will need to cure. Uh, the glue will need to cure over 24 hours. But if I give it about an hour, I think that would be enough time just to test it out and see if it works. Okay, so why did I choose to repair this versus uh, just buying a new carpet, Doctor? Well, like I said, it's an, it's an old older uh, Hoover uh, carpet washer. I think the current generation is this one you see here. Which I pulled up on Amazon. Um, however, the price of this was somewhere in the neighborhood of something similar to here, somewhere between a hundred to to three hundred dollars when I first bought it. Bought it. I don't quite remember exactly how much I paid. But uh, when it comes to repairing it, uh, there's what I bought found on Amazon for $31. So as you can see, versus outright replacement of the entire system, uh, replacing a little solenoid valve uh, pump was relatively cheaper. So those are things to consider, I suppose, if you like to re repair things from uh, at home versus uh, replacing it. You know, As I mentioned, you can find these in, in a lot of common items such as uh, coffee makers, steam cleaners, uh, uh, espresso machines. So, you know, maybe even dumpster dive, you could probably found a part for free. Uh, supposedly, as long as you can check it, you can verify that the coil doesn't have uh, too much resistance across it. Um, that it's operating fine. Right. But that would be, that's essentially the reason why I repair things versus buying a replacement outright now that some time has passed and i'm not gonna give this any uh, heavy use until uh, 24 hours has passed but i do want to go ahead and fill up the uh, water basin or whatever you want to call this with some hot water I do want to test to see if that solenoid that I swapped in is going to work and if it does uh, water should come out and feed through this hose attachment and then come out the nozzle here it should be under pressure well I have to turn the audio off on this side because it's about to get very loud so uh, I'll make sure to cut the audio out on the video And there you have it uh, as you saw fairly easy uh, repair the uh, sp spray jet the nozzle on the hose attachments uh, you know water is what I use but solution is spraying just fine um, is this the kind of repair that I would do in uh, you know for somebody or for a resale probably not I you know this is just a 
home jobber type of repair to keep something in use so I don't have to spend more money to replace but um, you know if you found this video uh, entertaining or uh, learned something from it and you like it then uh, you know please give that thumbs up uh, subscribe and share all right take care bye